very much, President Jones, and thank you for the warm introduction. You guys got to see a, the Creedence Legacy Band. I can't, uh, congratulations. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure to have been invited to make and now to be making this presentation to all of you, the delegates to the International Convention of the Brotherhood of Boilermakers, Iron Shipbuilders, Blacksmiths, Forgers, and Helpers. And I'm very pleased to extend greetings to all of you from the U.S. Secretary of Labor, Cabinet Member Thomas E. Perez, and Deputy Secretary of Labor Christopher Liu, and I join them in congratulating you and your union on your successful 2016 International Convention. I'm not exaggerating at all when I say this is truly one of the most treasured highlights of my three-year-plus term as director of the Office of Labor Management Standards, known and loved as OLMS, and really of my career in labor law and labor relations. I don't know, and I haven't asked why I was invited, uh, because I know better than to second guess uh, the decision and wisdom giving me the opportunity to speak to you all. There are many other agency and department heads in the U.S. Department of Labor whom the International uh, Boilermakers could have invited. Maybe I'm biased, but I think your union chose the right one. But I don't say that out of any belief, I assure you, that I'm the best speaker among my colleagues. We've got some real speech makers. Uh, the Boilermakers Union, and I'll say a little more about this later, is a union that keeps up with the times and knows what's going on. So I think that the Boilermaker Convention planners knew that the agency I direct, OLMS, is considered within the U.S. Department of Labor, DOL, to be the DOL agency that knows unions and interacts the most with unions. One way I know this is because whenever anyone contacts DOL and about any union or more than one union or even mentions the word union, they send that to us uh, in OMS. And often when we communicate uh, with that person, turns out their reason for contacting DOL has nothing to do with the work that OMS does uh, or the laws we administer, but we always make sure uh, that person gets directed to some other government agency uh, to help them. But as a result of OLMS's knowledge of and interactions with unions, I've been fortunate to have been involved with President Obama's project on promoting worker voice, on which the Labor Department, unsurprisingly, has played a key role. It seems plausible to me that per, quite likely a number of persons in this room might have attended the White House Summit on worker voice that was held last October, or one of the regional or national worker voice summits that have been held around the United States, including at the Labor Department's headquarters. Both President Obama and Secretary Perez have said a number of times, and I agree and will repeat now here, that union representation and collective bargaining are centrally important to worker voice in the United States and in North America. As you all know better than I do, Employees represented by the Boilermakers and other unions are given effective voice through your unions. But all of you and your colleagues and other unions that work so hard to enhance uh, the voice of unionized employees, whether you know it or not, you are serving as models for millions of other workers who lack union representation. That's what made possible, you might have heard of it, the fight for 15 and the fight for paid leave uh, that uh, Department of Labor is doing all over the country. It's the model of what unions have been able to do for their members that makes that uh, anyone even conceive that that's possible. So that gives me the opportunity to hear, salute, and acknowledge your Boilermakers Union, which throughout the U.S. and Canada has been committed to reaching out to the unorganized. What your union does for the disorganized, like I am more often than I like, I don't know, but for the people who don't have union representation, you've, you've reached out your hand and done a lot, and I, and I salute you for that. We in OMS know that advancing and expanding worker voice is not easy. 
and it's a lesson we've relearned the hard way just in the past few months from the enormous resistance to our so-called persuader rule. That's the rule to require employers and uh, to file reports and consultants who employers hire to oppose union organizing or union activity. It's been said uh, that that rule is to put the management back in the Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act, which requires the report filing. Consultants is the term that that statute uses uh, to refer to these persons hired to fight unions, and we call them persuaders in the rule because they're hired to persuade employees to reject unions, often through scaring or enticing workers. Many or all of you probably know them better by the name union busters. I realize a number of you in this room know the story of OMS's persuader rule. Our agency worked on it for seven years uh, before uh, we published it this March, March 2016. But I want to emphasize, because I know many of you in this room can truly appreciate how short and simple that rule's reports are compared with what's required for union reporting. The persuader report the, is two pages. The employer report is four pages. And if that arouses jealousy in any of you who file LM reports of dozens and sometimes even hundreds of pages, I could understand. Like union reports, the employer and persuader reports would be posted on OMS's website. And that's because the main purpose of that rule is, to re is so that thousands of employees who every month are deciding whether to have a union represent them. That's based only on the NLRB election statistics. And of course, there's a lot of organizing that goes on without the US National Labor Relations Board. But we checked, and thousands of employees are making the decision every month. And we wanted, thought that it was right that they should be able to access information that they're, about the anti-union messages that they're repeatedly hearing and seeing including that maybe it was these professional persuaders, outside groups, and not their own supervisors, or even you know, their employers who are the true source of the messages that employers and supervisors delivered. Now even though, as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, the persuader rule requires only simple and short reports, the amount and level of opposition to the rule was enormous, and it started immediately after the rule was published. Within weeks of that, um, there were, and even before the rule was supposed to go into effect, which was the first of this month, we had multiple congressional hearings attacking it, bills introduced in both the House and the Senate to kill it, and Secretary Perez and I were sued by name in three different states by dozens of persuader firms, trade associations, and employers, and by 11 states. One judge refused to block the rule, and one judge hasn't yet made a decision, but a federal judge in Texas did give the opponents what they asked for. It's an order blocking the rule across the United States. Just yesterday, the Department of Labor uh, sent a memo requesting appeal um, of that ruling. I don't know any better than any of you how that's going to come out, but we are uh, looking to appeal and, and getting that rule in effect. But the amount of opposition I just described is incredibly expensive. So we in OLMS have recently learned or relearned how much money, effort, and time and everything else opponents of unions are willing to spend to fight anything related to union representation. By the way, one misleading argument that opponents of the persuader rule have been making is that unions don't have to report their payments to lawyers or the funds they spend on organizing. And again, those of you who file LM2 reports know that's untrue because you don't know on those reports unions itemize and report their payments to attorneys and law firms and the purposes for which those payments were, wet, were made, as well as other payments to any outside firms or businesses who might help organizing efforts. So that, and of course, if you have full-time or paid-time organizers on your staff, or if you're like the international boilermakers have an organizing department, you have to 
uh, report the compensation uh, you pay to them. Um, so that's a, a false, uh, that's a false attack on the rule and we are going to, uh, we keep bringing that up and, and eventually someone's going to listen. But since I've mentioned the reports, let me talk about the annual report, briefly about the annual reports unions are required to file. Uh, you probably all know they are posted on OMS's website. Public disclosure of those reports is required by U.S. law and it was intended to benefit union members. But in addition to the union members, there are also anti-union organizations and staffers of anti-union politicians who are now monitoring union reporting. And if and when unions fail to report on time or they file reports that seem to be leaving out important information that unions are required to provide, OMS hears from those monitors. Actually, they don't contact us directly. They contact, you know, my boss, the Secretary of Labor uh, or the Deputy Secretary and say OMS isn't going after uh, the reports that are due from Union X or Union Y. And of course, OMS is required by law to obtain the reports that unions are required by law to provide. That's why OMS employees from our field offices around the U.S or our national office, or both, contact unions and interact with unions to get reports. So consider this my warning uh, to you. Uh, please do what you can to ensure your unions submit their financial reports, annual financial reports on time. And permit me to briefly share another warning regarding annual, annual reports, and this is uh, pretty uh, hot off the presses, as they say, a development from earlier this week. On Monday of this week, the White House approved the Labor Department's and OMS's proposal that unions with less than $250,000 in annual receipts be required to file their annual report electronically. That's for LM3 and LM4 reports. Those of you who file LM2 reports, uh, probably maybe everybody in the room knows that if you get, you know, more than $250,000 in dues and other receipts in your fiscal year, you have to file electronically. That's been true for about 10 years. Uh, but now the next step is basically all union annual reports will be required to be filed electronically. Uh, that will not go into effect. I mean, you won't have to do that until the year 2018 because it applies, uh, it will apply first to union financial reports uh, starting on or after January 1st, 2017. So of course 12 months in a fiscal year, so no fiscal year uh, that this applies to could uh, end until December 31st, 2017 and then your reports are due 90 days after that. So, but starting in 2018, LM3 and LM4 reports for the smaller unions, those with less than $250,000 in receipts, uh, you'll be required to use the electronic filing system of OMS to file those reports. Um, th let me first say the reason for that is because we were told by lawyers and not just ju the Labor Department lawyers but lawyers from elsewhere in the federal government that allowing paper filing uh, was likely in violation of disability rights laws. Uh, there are uh, people uh, with certainly visual impairments, but also some learning disabilities, mental impairments, the delays that are caused by paper filings and the scanning of paper filed reports, especially those that are filled out uh, handwritten, uh, we were told probably violates disability rights laws uh, on access to uh, information the federal government has. So because of that, we have to require electronic filing. Now the good news is you got 20 months uh, to get ready for it as of today um, and uh, it's, it's free now, it didn't used to be free, it's free electronic filing, um, it's much easier than it was to even a few years ago um, and we provide on the OMS website tutorials on how to use EFS to file LM3s, how to use it to file LM4s, lots of educational information. Um, our investigators all around the country are willing to provide in-person training um, over the next 20 months for the electronic filing. Um, and finally, our national office 
is willing to provide webinars and we've done that with some success um, and so that's another option. So just contact me, literally, uh, me personally, if you want any help in the, within the next 20 months to uh, figure out how to file um, LM3 and LM4 reports using EFS. And if it's really difficult for your union to do that, uh, there, we did provide for applying for a temporary hardship um, exemption saying I can't do it electronically now, uh, I'll try later but can you accept the paper report. So I, that ended up taking more time than I wanted to but it, it's, I know it's an important issue for a lot of people so uh, that's uh, EFS. Um, I want to close on a brighter note and I will close shortly. So I want to now share with you some personal reason why, reasons why for me it's such a pleasure and honor to be invited to this convention. One reason is something in my background um, and it was mentioned that I practiced labor law, I was a union lawyer and specifically in that I was fortunate enough to be a lawyer at the Washington DC firm that since the 1950s has served as the counsel for the AFL-CIO's building and construction trades department of which the Boilermakers has been a valued and vital member since 1931. So for many years, including years in which I think many of you were Boilermakers Union members and perhaps already officers, you were sort of one of my clients. And I was certainly proud then to be associated with such a distinguished union, with such impressive workers in the U.S. and in Canada as its members. I'm proud, I'm as proud now to be in the presence of the delegates elected by those talented union members. Who, all of you who serve as leaders who in the past few days have been making important decisions about the future of your great union. And I don't say great lightly, as my admiration for your Boilermakers Union is an even more important reason why I treasure speaking at your convention. I mentioned a minute ago met your membership in the Building and Construction Trades Department and I watched the video that began today's session. But as large and important as the construction industry is, it is of course just one of the many parts of the North American economy that the Boilermakers members work in and through their work make possible to continue and operate as successfully as they do. I'll use broad terms here, transportation, energy, manufacturing and more. The list is not only long, but expanding and ever-changing as technology changes, as business changes, and really as life and work in North America change. And I deeply admire how your Boilermakers Union and your international union keep up with those changes through your most programs and in so many other ways. So I'll leave you now by saying and I have in mind the tens of thousands of employees your union represents and the millions of persons in North America and around the world who benefit from their work, I extend gratitude for the time and the efforts and the talents you all dedicate to serving Boilermakers members as well as you do. Thanks for your attention and I wish you all continued success and safe travels back to your homes. Thank you.